Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining Welcome. us tonight at our EXO group tonight Founders our Networking group. Event. Uh, for those of you members. who are not familiar with EXO group, group, we, we are, are the parent of the Knife and Marissa and the Bump. Of My name is Kathy Wu Brady, and I'm the Executive Kathy Vice President Brady, of our Commerce Registry of uh, Guest Services and Guest Services Businesses. And guest services businesses. <laughs> <laughs> um, if any of you have ever planned a wedding or been part of a wedding, you're probably familiar with the Knot. been part of a wedding. Uh, and if any of you have set up a home, then you can understand and the challenges there, and that's been that reserve. The, 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 the bump is all about the baby, the pregnancy, about and baby, starting that new life with another person. And starting that new life. We at Exo Group have been around since 1996 with our very own female founder, Carly Roney, leading the way and creating a company that we are so excited to share with you all tonight. The founders group, the founders that we have was created so that we could go and celebrate additional women who have been women Way to go, who can be courageous, innovative, and we're developing new betas. And um, we're really excited tonight because tomorrow night is International Women's Day, and we're going to be doing some really exciting things. And we're going to be doing on Exo Group's social channels. I think it's a wonderful moment to go and celebrate women, to go and celebrate, talk about gender equality. And uh, we really hope that you guys join us. And uh, we really hope that you guys join us. I am so excited to welcome the co founders of Bobble Bar, Amy Jane and Danielle Bar, Gage Jane. We are so excited to have you guys here tonight to share your journey. To share your journey. For those of you on Facebook Live, we're going to have you give the opportunity to ask questions as well. And everybody here joining us in the New York office. Everybody here joining us in the New York office. Let's get started. Pick us off. Can you guys tell us a little bit about yourself and where you grew up? And uh, uh, what you thought might be uh, your future uh, lives. Maybe it's a little different, different than where you ended up. Lives. Maybe it's a little different mm -hmm. than where you ended up. Sure. Um, so, my name is Danielle Yoffman. I am originally uh, from uh, Westchester, New York, and then my family moved to Las Vegas once when I was a little kid to Las Vegas. So, now I tell people I'm from Las Vegas. So, now I tell people I'm from Las Vegas. And for a really long time, actually, I really wanted to be a singer. I really wanted to be a singer. And I ended up working and then became an investment banker. And I ended up working and then became an investment banker. Not in line with the original plan. Um, um, but um, but um, I have a special plan. I obviously um, eventually um, kind of found out how it's eventually kind of. There's still time for the singing. There's still time. 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 There's still
And honestly, the one time that like our, I would say our background ca like came up, which is, all right, who's going to build the financial model that like pitches the company? We both went like this. <laughs> and then, and then Amy was like, mm, but you're a little better at it. So please do it. And I was like, all right, fine, I'll do it. And then we ultimately ended up doing it together. So it, I feel like everything ultimately was up for grabs. That's great. And what about, what about things that you didn't just didn't agree upon? Like something that you felt passionately one way and then the other person felt the other way. How did you guys resolve that? Honestly, Do you we, have an example? People ask us this question all the time, and our, we, don't, we don't have those moments. And I know that sounds crazy, like how can you have things that you don't agree on or don't see eye to eye? There's always those things of like, well, I think we should do it this way, but there's always a conversation. We really do see decisions through two different like perspectives, and we always feel like when we have this conversation, it, we get to the right answer. We don't have these like crazy debates or disagreements. The other thing that's been amazing is we don't make those decisions anymore. <laughs> we have an amazing team. You know, we've been very self-aware and very honest with ourselves since day one about what we can do and what we can't do. And what we can't do, we've really tried to hire, um, you know, folks into the family that can help us build the business. And we do really rely on them to help us make these decisions, which I think is also it, it's helped the business, but it also helps us never have to be in that moment. That's a great segue. So like, tell us a little bit more about building your team. How did you guys establish what the culture would be? How did you figure out which person to hire first? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in the early days, it's really very much like, uh, you know, you're meeting these you know, impressive people, and we really needed people with like very specific skill sets. Um, and in the early days, you are really trusting that you are going to find these people and convince them to believe in the vision of what you want to build. And you're really like selling the dream because, I mean, at that, you know, you're, you're literally two people working out of, at the time, a little hole in the wall office in one of those like shared workspaces. Like our plants were dying. Like it was like, it was not a good scene. Um, and we are really fortunate that we found amazing people who really believed in the idea of what we wanted to build. And as we sort of pitched out the company based on what we felt was a consumer need based on our own personal experiences, we were really lucky that we found a number of folks who, who, who felt similarly and wanted to come on board and grow with us. Um, and then I think in terms of culture, um, you know, we are really lucky in that we both came from backgrounds where, you know, we learned a little bit about, you know, what we wanted to carry forward. Um, and then also, you know, coming from a little, I would say, kind of rough and tumble, lots of FaceTime um, kind of environments, we knew a lot about what we didn't want to carry forward. Um, so it, for us, and again, since I think we met in a work environment, we had a lot of conversations about um, what elements of those environments we personally didn't, didn't love about work, um, that you know, we were able to carry that forward and, and really think about the type of environment that we wanted to build. The way we built our team at the beginning is a little bit different than how we think about building our team today. At the beginning, you have no money to pay anyone. And so it was basically like, what can the two of us physically not do or figure out? And let's go hire, let's spend like group all our money and figure out a way to pay them to do it. So, I mean, I was shipping every order. We both have great, like five customer service names. Like I can answer customer service emails all night long, but I can't, you know, photograph jewelry beautifully. I can't build, do the code for the e-commerce site. So that's kind of how we were approached it early on. And then we got some really good advice. Um, when we were starting the business, we had some really nice mentors that always um, were preparing us for tomorrow. And I don't think we ever understood 
what they were telling us next. We're like, we don't have that problem right now. Like, we need to solve this one. But as we were going through, we're like, oh, wow, like we knew how to start thinking about this. But they said, when your business starts growing, you start scaling, you really do need to be honest about the team you had and the team that you need. And um, as long as the conversations are happening over the years, it's good for everyone of bringing on team members that, that frankly know what they're doing. Um, we uh, you know, got very lucky early on that we were able to find um, people when we were two to three years in that were so experienced that were happy to kind of flex down and almost take a step back to help us get to a place where the business could start scaling. But we brought in an amazing COO, we brought in an amazing chief sourcing officer, um, you know, and we didn't have a merchandising team for three years. I didn't even know what a merchant did. Um, and that's where I think our perspective on hiring has really changed, which is you want to find people that um, have domain expertise but are excited about uncharted territory and really okay to question why things happen the way they are and do things differently. And so that evolution in thinking about how you build your team has been new for us, but also really a, a nice process. That's great. And what are your tips around hiring the right people, given those parameters? Are there any kind of secret sauce things that you would um, share with the group here? We spend a lot of time um, with team members outside of a normal interview context. That ends up being very formal and everyone, you know, we all prepare for our interviews. And so the drinks, the casual meetings, having them come and spend a day at the office, you really do get an understanding of the rapport you're going to have with someone that literally needs to be your right hand and almost complete your sentences and execute your strategy and make it better. And that's been um, a really successful strategy for us, which is an extended time to get to know someone so that it's really clear that the make sure you're on the same page about work style, work ethic, strategy, how they lead a team, how they manage a team, um, and doing it outside of a traditional interview process has been good for us. It's a great tip, a great tip. Um, what about the investors? How did you guys handle that piece of the growth of the company? Yeah, I think that we're, that is actually one area where I think our background really did come into play and help. Um, because both Amy and I had experience not only in investment banking and also in private equity. Um, so certainly not an exact, you know, comparable for, for venture capital, um, because we invested in profitable companies. But, um, you know, certainly taught us a lot about how you raise money and what are the types of questions people would ask. Um, so I feel like in the beginning we always had a really good sense of how to put, you know, the right presentation together that really sort of anticipated you know, what are the questions that an investor is probably going to ask you? Where are they going to dig? Where are they going to want more diligence? Like, where can we really beef up how we're telling the story? Um, we once actually, this is kind of a funny story. When we were raising our seed round, um, we were, we were uh, meeting with um, a very, very prominent um, seed investor here in New York and who ended up investing in us. And when we were done, he was like, guys, i got to tell you, this presentation is fantastic. If this doesn't work out, you guys should just do people's presentations. <laughs> and I was like, I gotta be honest with you. Uh, we used to do that in investment banking, and if the rest of my life is building pitch materials, I am literally gonna jump off a building. So please don't ever tell me that again, and thank you for the lovely compliment. And are you and, gonna invest? <laughs> and we'll take your check now, thank you, goodbye. Um, so I think that's an area we definitely were able to sort of anticipate um, and then also, I think, call bullshit a little bit. Like, I remember raising our seed round, and someone who was not used to doing seed investing asked us for a monthly mm -hmm. three-year cash flow. And I was like, well, we need to just stand up the site. Like, let's start there, and then we'll see if people buy the things, and then I'll build you a cash flow. Like, let's do that. Let's work backwards. It's interesting, because when you're raising money, you're like, so desperate to raise money and you don't get a chance to like almost realize that it's an interview process for your investor to make sure that they're going to be a good partner to you as you're growing the business and the minute that we would both catch each other would be like huh if that's the question they're asking us now can you imagine what it's going to be like that shows um, a complete misalignment for what we actually need help with today um and I think our backgrounds helped with that a lot yeah. Um, and then, you know, we were trying to raise money um, for a business that a lot of people, a lot of the people we were talking to didn't really understand because there is a psychology element to this category that we all get. Like, we see it, we, it, we get it. Like, I'm not going to even explain it. You, you know how fashion jewelry makes you feel. And that was an interesting 
hurdle for us to figure out how to get that male partner to, when we walked into that meeting to say, I'm investing. Um, what we used to do is we would have we would get all these meetings set up and we would time it so that right before we showed up for the important meetings, their assistant in the office had already gone through the unboxing and surprise and delight moment of getting a bottle bar package. We would send them a thank you present for setting up all the meetings for us and, and coordinating everything, and it, it really worked. Um, you know, the partner had someone that they trusted. You know talking about the jewelry, someone that they could talk to about the category, seeing all the women in their office kind of going crazy. So we had basically fast forwarded through the like, why does she need fashion jewelry to the, okay, tell me the fundamentals of your business model. Um, and we had that aha moment when we went to a meeting and someone was like, so, so you sell jewelry on the carts in the mall, right? And we were like, no. For the love of God, <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, and then we, I remember we had probably two meetings where we were sitting there and you know, you have an hour to like explain what it is that you're building and you want to spend that hour talking about like, you know, the meat and potatoes. Like you don't want to be talking about the peas and carrots, no offense to the peas and carrots. So typically you have like one slide on you know, the industry and what it is, and it's meant to be quick, and then you move on. And we were spending like 50 minutes on the industry. And we had two meetings where we were sitting and the male partner would like kick the door open, and be like, Julie, get in here, you know? And he'd like have his assistant come in and she'd sit there and he would make us literally repeat everything that we had already explained to him about women and how women shop for jewelry and what the category looks like. You know, and we'd, of course, you'd get the idea. It was like, well, my wife only wears Cartier. And I was like, okay, well, we're not selling to her, so let's move on. Um, and, you know, basically then we'd have, you know, poor Julie would sit there and she'd be like, yep, yeah, mm -hmm, yep, that's all accurate. That's exactly how I shop. Like, I love this. I love this story. I love this idea. Like, I would totally buy that. I'd totally shop that. And then finally we were like, okay. So since Julie's smart and Julie knows what is going on, and this guy is clearly like, not fucking getting it because we're not making self-driving cars. Like, let's just send Julie the package and then she'll talk to all the other women in the office and then they'll get to watch the experience, right? Because people understand emotion and people understand that like women getting excited about buying products is ultimately, you know, what we do and, and we want our whole experience to be evocative of that experience. So that for us was that like aha moment because we went through like two of those and we we're like, oh my God, that was Please don't ever, let's not ever do that again. <laughs> That's wonderful. Are there any examples of either investors or board members being helpful in your process? So half our, more than half our board's women. So our lead investor was a woman. Um, and subsequently after that, a few others. It's nice to have um, the perspective in the boardroom because they understand the psychology and a lot of the decisions you're making is not black and white, it's not numbers. It's we're trying to create an experience of open emotion, and uh, it's helpful for them to participate in the dialogue. We also, um, uh, I guess, so we've raised um, a couple rounds of funding. We, uh, one of our main investors, two of our main investors are VCs, and the third main investor is kind of like a hybrid strategic VC. His name's Chris Birch. He started Tory Birch with his husband, or his wife, or ex-wife, and over the years has had some other businesses. And he has been so incredibly helpful. Um, he is so forthcoming with the lessons he's learned, especially the things that haven't worked out. And then, you know, for our business, it, there's a very important marketing component, but there's a very, very important production and sourcing component to what we do because we're trying to bring product, the right product to her fast. Um, and he's been incredibly helpful, um, helping us navigate it and helping us uh, make sure that we could uh, get a lot of the kinks that were going on in our business ad addressed quickly so that we could scale with the opportunities that we've had. Um, we've always been, and I think it has to do with our background, we've always been very thoughtful about the investors we've brought in. Um, we've always wanted to make sure that they understood the two of us, that we're not going to grow a business like this and you look under the hood and it's like a mess. Um, let us build a business the way that we want to. We're always going to be forthcoming when things go sideways and when we need help. But we've also been very honest about why we are inviting you into our family and kind of what we need you to help us with and where we need the support. It's not like we've been in a fortunate position to do that. It's that we've actively navigated who we talk to about our business and who we bring in so that we can make sure that like we have the support network we need and they know that we're kind of expecting it from them. Um, but we, we, I don't think there are a lot of founders out there that say this, but we love our investors. And like our board meetings are fun.
which is wonderful like, <laughs> and which rare. Is rare, and we got we've gotten lucky. And you worked at it. <laughs> Don't be so humble. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, well, that, that's great, and and. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the core business. You guys did a lot of research beforehand. You just said you were very thoughtful about your entire process. Was there anything about jewelry or e-commerce that was surprising to you or that you think might be surprising to folks listening tonight? Um, I mean, so many things. Um, I think in the beginning, um, anytime we were launching anything, if it was a product, if it was an email, if it was a landing page, if it was like... We were so, so, so nervous to get it wrong, and we would agonize over every single little piece. And I actually remember the first email we sent, we actually held I hands. Just like, we, were so yeah. hands. We, we would hold hands and we would press send, as if like, we were gonna like blow something up Like when we pressed send. It was like, oh my god. You know, and, and then you go through a few emails, and then you get a few customer service responses, and you're like, huh, nobody reads anything. <laughs> And I don't know if there's like a literacy problem or just an attention span problem or just like literally nobody reads or remembers anything, anything. Like literally nobody, um, nobody remembers what I told you five minutes ago. And for us, I think that was a really big important learning, which is, you know, you get it 95% of the way there and then get it out there and start collecting customer feedback and start iterating and improving and making it better and better and better and better. Because I think the more that we work on things with blinders on and we don't start incorporating some of that customer feedback as early as possible, the more we sort of agonize over this perfect experience. And, and that's the other thing we realize is like, if it's digital and it's online, it's okay. You can rip it all out and change it. And literally, nobody is going to remember what it looked like. Like people you know, forget that our website in 2011 was like on a black background. Oh my God, what was that? Like MySpace. Um, you know, and you, you change it, and it's okay. So, yeah, that was a big one. That's great. Um, you've recently forged some partnerships. So you just talked about e-commerce and how it's digital, and you just take it out. Um, you've actually partnered with some really big offline retailers who have big online presence as well. Target, Anthropology, Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about how those came about, uh, what you can share, yeah. and then, you know, what has it done for the business? So... Um, we knew early on that we needed to have a physical component to our business. It's, it's jewelry. It's not a natural thing to buy online as much as we like to, to think it is. Uh, and it's an, it's an impulse purchase. You see it it's somehow in person. So we did a lot of testing early on with pop-up shops, and it, the metrics were unbelievable. Literally, our basket size was like three and a half times what it is online, and like the frequency of like the customer coming back was so much higher. So we had done um, this crazy ambitious pop-up shop in Soho for three months. And it was basically what we decided as a team is that this is our chance to really tell the world what we can do. We don't get a chance to do it on our e-commerce site, but let's demonstrate it. Let's show who shops with us. Let's show how excited they get. Let's, and then let's also get to go out there and meet our customers. And as we did it, um, we had worked so hard on it that we didn't realize what an awesome thing we had created. And at that pop-up, all of these retailers had gone through it. And it was interesting, we started getting calls towards the end of it, and they were like, we've had someone come to your shop like seven times over the course of the last two months, and every time we came, there was like 100 people in there. And can you please do that in our space? So that's how it started. Um, and then it's kind of really evolved to a much more um, traditional, you know, retail partnership where we've had the opportunity because these partnerships started with uh, more senior executives to say this is really important, you're a key retailer, we don't have a broad offline presence, it's important that our brand is presented this way, we would like to be heavily involved in the merchandising and the marketing, um, and it's been a great way for us to introduce our product uh, to new women. It's been a great way to service our customer who does shop with us online because, again, we, are, we need to be there when she wants to buy jewelry, and by not being at the stores that she's buying her clothes, like we're not helping her with that purchase. Um, in terms of how it's been helping our e-commerce business, we've seen that it's actually just lifted everything. Um, you know, we're generating more conversation about the brand. We're getting to tell our story a lot of different ways, especially because the product can be tailored to the different retailers. Um, and it's it's brought a lot of new people into the brand. So it's been a really positive story. We've, again, lucked out with our retail partners. They are truly awesome, and they've been so much fun to work with. It's rare to find a retail partner that is so forward-thinking and, and open to trying new things, and they've been able to do that with us, which is, I think, kind of really been what's driven the success there. 
That's great. What, um, is there a dream collaboration that you guys would like to have, whether it be a retailer or you know, a celebrity? <laughs> yes. We have emailed someone at Zara every week for the last two years. <laughs> we would love to do their jewelry if anyone from if you know, know anybody any at Zara, <laughs> listen up. <laughs> we are, we are, yeah, Kate Middleton. We would love to to do her high low. She wears jewelry from Zara. She should wear Baba Bar. Um, we got to do one of our dream ones a couple years ago. We love Olivia Palermo style. Um, it is just you see it and you're like you feel like you can do it. Um, but it's still yet so aspirational, and so she, uh, we had found out through friends that she was a fan of the brand, so she worked with us, and it was so much fun, and our customers loved it. We have a long, long, long list <laughs> of women who we, like, inappropriately email and, like, figure out, like, how to, you know, how to get in there. Literally just send them for jewelry. Um, it's a good way. Uh, yeah. I, I, so I was, when Obama was negotiating the fiscal cliff, I was part of a small group of entrepreneurs who got to go meet him, and he complimented my necklace. And I, they like, were like, you absolutely cannot give him anything. I was like, for Michelle? For Michelle? <laughs> for Michelle? <laughs> and they were like, they were like, oh, seriously, put your hand down. Like, we, will, we will shoot you. Like, don't touch him. <laughs> <laughs> so we like we literally we won't stop though we'll keep sending gifts we're on it that's awesome yeah. that's great um what's next for bobble bar i'm like where do i even start <laughs> um so we use uh, a hashtag internally when we sign off on all of our emails gbd um global bobble domination um so really i think that's just the general vision and then just every step that it takes to get us there, we will, we will continue. That's great. That's great. Um, how have each of you grown or changed since you started the company? Gosh, so much. I think um, when, you, when you start a business, you don't even think about what the responsibilities are if it starts working. And the responsibilities when it starts working is when you start growing up. I think that that's been the really humanizing piece of this whole journey. It's, I mean, I think a lot of my headspace is not like, okay, how do I fix this in the business? It's how do I make sure my team uh, feels like the right opportunities are there? These people, there was an opportunity cost for them to quit their jobs and come join us. Like, how do I make sure that I'm constantly helping them build their careers? They have mortgages. Like, it's just like all of that stuff that comes with it. and. That bit, um, I think we have <laughs> grown up tremendously uh, and in a really positive way. Um, it's also been interesting because you know we started this business six years. We were both single. We were having a ton of fun, and you know this journey has also been part of our journey of life. Um, you know, we, there's a baby now involved, and you know marriage and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, you're navigating all that while doing that, and. It's been nice because your life journey also requires you to grow up, and it's we've been able to bring that back to our business so that uh, we remember that we're like leaders and now a big team. Um, we have this story. So this happened um, three years ago. Our I Christmas really party. Don't know where you're going. Oh my God! I know where you're going. <laughs> you get we to tell us. We have a Christmas party every year, and um, it's it's we have a really fun team, um, dance parties and all that stuff. So. Uh, my husband is also the most social human being alive and loves to go out and stuff. And he came up to me during our Christmas party and he was like, do you guys know that you're not in business school anymore? He was like, things are getting out of control. And it's like those moments of like, oh my gosh, like we have actually, like we run a company. Oh yeah, like we can't be in this bar like doing all of these, you know, everyone's sitting on tables and all this stuff and there was crazy things and it's, it's just these moments happen, and um, it, it just it wakes you up. <laughs> How about you, Daniela? Yeah, I think I think it would definitely be a lot of the same. Um, so, some closing questions before we open it up to our audience. Um, where do you find inspiration and motivation personally? Like, if you're if you're feeling down, or if you're feeling like, wait, today I just don't feel right. How do you get yourself back on track? So I think it's a lot about finding what are some of those moments that allow you just a little bit of alone time and me time and taking care of yourself time. And I think that those are, are different for everybody. Um, I think that we move a mile a minute. So I feel like my like 
I have to keep changing what my moments are because I keep, like, I, you know, for a while I was like, it's Bikram yoga because I'm working so hard on not falling over that I don't think about work. And then I was like, nope, got that pose. Now I think about the homepage while I'm like <laughs> lifting my leg over my head. I was like, now I gotta find something else. Um, so I actually really love acupuncture. I'm a huge fan. Um, I do that about once a week or once every other week. I got a guy who's amazing because somebody's wondering. Um, and then I actually do, I really love sensory deprivation, which is you float in salt water and you get in a tank and you close the door and you can't see or hear or smell anything. Um, and you, it's basically like, it's, it's like a, it's like a meditation essentially, but in a salt water tank that you won't drown in. Um, so yeah, I do that. I do a lot of that. That's great. How about you, Amy? Uh, my latest thing is turning off my phone. I am addicted. And I didn't realize it until um, I had my baby, my daughter. And you're kind of forced to be away from it. And I realized, oh, wow, well, like, I'm actually thinking. Because you're not, like, just sitting there, like, scrolling with, like, one eye open looking at your feed. And I found myself um, being uh, a lot more productive at work. Um, and so that's something that I actually now do really consistently. Um, and it's great. It's like we don't think anymore, right? We're just constantly checking our emails or checking Instagram, um, and that's been a, a nice thing. It's wonderful. One last question, and then we'll open it up. So we have some entrepreneurs in the audience, some female founders with us as well. What do you wish you knew? You've already given a lot of great tips tonight, actually, so this would be something different or in addition. What do you wish you knew before or while you were starting Bobble Bar? Um, I think starting... I think probably the biggest thing that we were both scared of starting is like, if it doesn't work, we'll be okay. Like, we'll we be able to figure it out. We'll be able to find something else. We'll like, we'll be, will we be hireable, you know, if we have a company that, that doesn't make it off the ground? Um, and I, I um, you know, it took us a little bit longer to get there, but I really wish that, that earlier on we had sort of felt that like, it's going to be great. You're going to be great. You know, I think um, starting something, and even if it totally crashes and burns, you learn a tremendous amount. And I think that those are such valuable skills um, to be able to say that you, you know, went out and you started something, and, you know, it's important that you learn from the things that didn't work and you use those and carry those forward. Um, but I think that it's, you know, we're, we're trained to some degree to be a little bit scared of that unknown um, and scared of, you know, what will happen if this won't be the thing. Um, and it'll be okay. So, yeah. Great tip. Mine's not going to be as positive. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. Okay, okay. Sometimes gonna... the negative's helpful, okay. too. Okay. You can be, you can be um, like the other side of my black and white cookie. Now, I will say that if today, had we known what we know today when we started, we would still do this over again. We would just do it better. Um, but, you know, you have to be prepared for it. You can never turn it off. And, you know, we all have had jobs that we just love so much. You're so loyal to your boss. You're ready to work every day, every hour. But your problems and your worries are different. And, you know, I remember nights where, like, I get an email from a team member and they've lost their health insurance card and it's 2 a.m. and they need their number. And it's, you know, there's just small things like that plus just the, the, the things that you're constantly thinking about. I think just mentally being ready for that from day one is really, really important. And that I think the other thing for us that it took us a while to realize is you, we not only have to be strong for each other, because it, there's a lot of you know, moments where things are going sideways, you really you have to be strong for everyone. And there's no one anymore to tell you, thank you, good job. You know, I saw our investors like, are you going to tell us good job? Like, come on, like someone say it. Um, so it's funny, my husband now is like, good job. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just, it's just knowing. It's like we had this moment where we're like, Oh my god, I don't think anyone has ever told us, like, way to go. Um, but the minute you realize that, it's like you have this moment of, like, okay, I understand what my responsibility is and what I have signed up for and what I'm so excited and energized to do. Uh, but it, it, it took us a while to figure that out. Yeah. One time so, someone told us we didn't fuck something up, and that was positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, way to go, girls. <laughs> Aim high. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is great. Well, let's open up our questions to the audience now. Any questions? Yes. How did you deal with being in, or were you ever intimidated from presenting to investors? And how did you deal with that? The question was, were you ever intimidated about presenting to investors, and how did you deal with it? 
I, I don't know if intimidated is necessarily the right word, but I think that when you are fundraising and you are in the really early stages and you don't know where the money is going to come from, I think there is definitely that inherent like pressure yes. is on fear. Um, and, you know, I think that it's about um, just sort of spending a lot of time practicing and figuring out, you know, what is the right method for you. I think some people do really well to sort of practice in front of a friend. We have each other. We can mm -hmm. practice in front of each other. Um, so, you know, we definitely didn't, like, go in cold and wing it. I mean, we were, I feel like our first few pitches, we were sitting in the office. We were pitching to each other. We would ask each other tough questions. Um, we would pitch to friends. We would get friends who, you know, worked in the investment community to come and give us tips and advice. Um, and I feel like if that's something that you, you know, naturally are very nervous about, I think the more practice, the more you get it under the be your belt, the, the more that you can get it. So, you know, it's a script and you feel really comfortable with it, the more that you can sort of eliminate some of those unknowns and just kind of walk in there and nail it. And if anyone needs help or just a sounding board, we love doing that. We have founders in and out of our office constantly, and it stays between us and the founders, but, you know, we haven't done it in a while, but sometimes you just need someone to be there and you're, that's like, can just be someone outside of your company to help you through it, so if there's anything that we can ever help with. There's also, I feel, um, the investment in, uh, industry has changed like a little bit. There's so many friendly voices and, and, and people now that didn't exist before, and we gravitate towards them because we're like, I don't want to deal with you know that other side of it. So even finding the, the the investors that do have a little bit more of a friendly tone that ends up being more conversational it doesn't mean the questions aren't going to be there, but it does take away a little bit of the intimidation because it is a more natural way to explain your business and talk about it. Um, That's great. Other questions. Maybe that's a weird question, but like... No, it's not. I, let, I was an investment banker, I left in banking, I opened up a bakery, and I've been doing it for a few years, and I just don't know... I'm so used to that corporate, corporate atmosphere, feeling yeah. like a real company, that sometimes I feel like this is like a side project, and that mentality of like, it's all going to be okay. The question is, when did it feel like a real business? I think it's when people were like, oh my god, you work at Bobble Bar? <laughs> like, you've heard of us? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think it was something like that. When we were like, whoa, like people actually know who we are, where they're excited about what we're doing, and they want to see us succeed. And I, and I know that's like not a really helpful answer, but it, it wasn't a metric. It wasn't the size of a team or sales or anything like that. It was just the this reaction that we were getting from women of like they wanted us to keep going and that's when we were like wow like okay like let's go um, but that for us was the was the inflection point I don't know when that happened but I do distinctly remember feeling like okay <laughs> but it was a, it was a couple years in great we have some questions from our Facebook live group yes so Laura on Facebook asked what about Bobble Bar and your journey as co-founders are each of you most proud of? Oh, wow. Danielle and I used to do every single thing together. Uh, everything. And I think we've always been worried that, like, you know, your friendship would, you know, would always, we'd always be talking about work. Or you wouldn't do all the things that you normally would do as best friends. And... I think we've done a great job keeping that, which is shocking sometimes. Like, we can have dinners with our significant others and go on trips and all this stuff, and it, like, work doesn't come up, uh, even though we're, like, texting each other on the side. <laughs> they don't need to know. Um, but that has been, I think that was actually one of our biggest worries about doing this together, which is, like, are we not going to do all the things that we used to do? And that's, I, for me, that's been a really awesome thing. Yeah. That's great. Other questions? One in the back. Um, I was wondering, uh, raising money on the East Coast versus the West Coast. Um, so, you know, we're in our seed round right now, and East Coast has been hard. West Coast seems to be easier because they believe in dreams out there. I was just wondering <laughs> whether, uh, what your experience was, especially raising as a woman. Yeah, so, um, 
Ooh, I got a few thoughts. So seed round, I would say definitely do not take money from a larger VC in your seed round. And I could later walk you through the reasoning why, but it has a lot to do with like game mechanics and your A round and just, just don't do it. Um, East versus West Coast, I don't, you know, I don't know that we necessarily, I think in your seed round, um, it's, it's tough to say because if you're not really raising from some of the big guys, I think you can find some really, really great seed investors here. I think you can also definitely find, you know, great folks on, on the West Coast too. Um, I think in general what you want to do though is you, you probably want to compress the time horizon as much as possible. So if you're going to go out to the West Coast, um, you know, you want to get introduced to as many people as humanly possible and try to you know, get your meetings kind of all in a row or get all your ducks in a row. Usually what you can do is at least schedule an intro, call, Skype, pitch, something, and then just know that most people are kind of doing their bigger partner meetings on Mondays. So to the extent that you can sort of get everything condensed into one Monday, it's a bitch, but you, you know, you spend a Monday and you kind of knock them all out. Um, I also think it's very dependent on industry. So I would say that given that we, you know, we're doing and are doing something in the sort of fashion e-commerce space. Um, you know, at the time there were some really, really nice seed, seed groups and I think that those have really grown that are in the New York area that tend to be fashion, media, consumer focused. Um, and there are some really nice, you know, folks to get introduced to here and we can always make recommendations if it's helpful. Um, but I would say at seed, seed, I don't know that you have to go to the West Coast, but it's certainly always helpful to kind of expand the network of people that you're reaching out to and it, it, if you can if you can swing it to go out for a trip it definitely doesn't hurt more questions so what are the qualities that you look for when you see a resume that's a good question yeah so for me, um, I, I think um, the operating side of someone's skill set is um, a very valuable thing for them to bring to a startup because you can be a great strategic thinker, but if you can't like, um, translate that to actions and roll it through the company, it doesn't matter. So, you know, we hire a lot of team members, you know, from finance and consulting, and it's really fun for me to when I see a little bit of an operating bent in some of the things that they've done, because it's like, okay, I can actually take your strategic thinking, but I know you're gonna know how to execute it because you at least understand the process in which you need to translate your ideas into. Um, so that's something that I definitely look for. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that. No, I feel like we don't pay attention to schools. In fact, I couldn't even tell you what schools people go to on our team. On our team. No. Um, I love, and I know no one reads letters and notes that come with uh, resumes. I do. People send me notes on LinkedIn. People send me emails. And I, and I really can tell how excited and hungry someone is to come in and contribute. Uh, and to me, I love that because sometimes like the role and the jobs are a little bit vague and amorphous and I just need someone that's going to like be okay rolling up their sleeves and just doing everything that kind of falls into like this even though your job is this uh, and it does come through to some of the softer softer touch points that come with a resume. Yeah, I was going to say I think we definitely had some people kind of stand out in terms of the things that they um, in addition to the resume, I would say the things that they like amend on, whether it's, you know, in order to cover letter, we've had folks, we once interviewed someone for a creative team who met us the week before our shared birthday, and she literally dropped off, and it was for the creative team, so it like made sense for the role, she dropped off for each of us a birthday in a box, oh God, where you would like take off the lid and have like all the, little, and it was, it really just showcased yeah. her skill set, her creativity, her ability to execute. We interviewed someone once once for a social position where she sent us, it was like very new at the time, but it was those cupcakes that you could put like flat like letters on top of. And she sent us a whole thing of cupcakes that said foot in the door. Um, and it's like super smart. Like those are the types of things like our social team loves and then spends an hour figuring out how to get like the perfect shot of. Um, you know, but things that are like very specific to the role and really showcase, again, Amy's point, like an ability to execute but is creative and really shows I think it's a hunger, essentially, um, to kind of get in there and shake things up and do some interesting stuff. Great. One over there. Hi, ladies. Um, what are some common dropout causes that are near and far and more of what are some of the that 
philanthropy and co corporate social responsibility? Um, so there are a lot of things that I know are, are near and dear to us personally, and then we really try to give the team an opportunity to weigh in on the things that are important to them and that they want to participate and be a part of. Um, for me personally, um, you know, there have been a few cases of cancer in my family, so that's definitely a cause that kind of hits close to home for me. Um, we actually had, um, we do a program called Guest Bartender, where we invite um, celebrities and influencers to come through to collection. And we had gotten an email through a friend of the brand who said, oh, a friend of a friend of mine, um, unfortunately, was just you know, diagnosed with late stage cancer. Um, she's based out of Texas. Her, her dream is to be a guest bartender. Um, and we got this email and we were like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. This is like, this is the only thing she wants. Like, I can't even believe, like, we're so tiny. Um, and we we're like, of course we're gonna do that. That's gonna be amazing. Um, and we got a chance, our team really, really had a good time with it. We got a chance to um, really, you know, work with her to design an amazing collection. We got to think about what the photo shoot experience was going to be, and we got to, you know, fly down to Texas, which is where she was based out of, and put together this incredible editorial photo shoot and hire a badass photographer and hair and makeup and styling and, like, have just this amazing day with her. And we invited her mom and all her friends to come. Um, we ended up actually joining all the proceeds from the collection um, to charity um, and then also to help her with, with some of her medical bills. Um, but that was one where it was such a personal component and she was a huge fan of the brand and I think the brand just really, we really took to it. It was something that was so meaningful and personal for us. Um, but we participate in lots of other smaller events I think that are happening in New York City. So I'm not sure people here are familiar with Bombas, but they're a sock company. Um, and they just did a huge sock giveaway for the homeless in New York City, so we participated in that. Um, so we try to find you know, lots of, of little events and, and find opportunities that the team can go be a part of, because I think it's also a really good opportunity just for team building, um, you know, and for people to find causes that are meaningful to each of them and to, to bond over. Great, living back there. Can you talk a little more about how you did consumer research, like who you spoke to, what kind of questions you asked, you did surveys, how broad it was? How did you guys go about doing your consumer research? Um, it was really scrappy. Um, so when we were doing our consumer research, we were in business school at the time. Um, so the benefit of that is that we had, you know, basically our class was about a thousand people. So call it about an even split between men and women, just to make it even easy math for me, the former banker. Um, so we had, you know, 500 um, unwilling. <laughs> Uh, participants that we were able to force this upon. Uh, but no, I mean, we had amazing women that we were very close with that we knew from school um, who were able to convince to come kind of be your guinea pigs. So we set up lots of different consumer research. We would set up um, focus groups where we would sit with like 20 or 30 women and we would put lots of different products in front of them and we would ask them what they were excited about, what they weren't excited about, what they would want to buy. Um, in the early days before we had kind of built our beta site, what we actually did was we were just, you know, buying product that we thought was interesting and to be able to collect broader feedback because at some point focus groups were just a little too hard to keep doing. Um, we would use photo sharing sites like Kodak Gallery um, and we'd stand up basically like these really janky pictures that we took in my apartment of the product and we would let people like play, place like fake orders and like leave all their comments. Um, so we found lots of different ways to start kind of collecting feedback, but it did help that we were in an environment where we were surrounded by the target customer, um, and she was in business school, so she wasn't doing anything all day. She was like really happy to help. Great. One more question. What's your marketing strategy? How do you create awareness? Um, I think we really benefit from the fact that we have such a conspicuous product. Um, so that's always been a big part of our strategy. You know, I think we really benefit from the fact that we really have grown up in the era of social media. Um, you know, when we were first starting the company, um, you know, Facebook was, was you know, really getting much, much, much bigger at the time and people were using it so consistently. And I think one of the things that that's really helped us become very comfortable with and really benefit from is you know, gone are the days of the only way for me to spread my message and share my brand is to invest thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into extremely produced, polished 
formal editorial, which for young brands is really, really hard. And I think one of the benefits of social media is it allows you to find you know, um, folks who have a similar mindset and similar customer needs and really enjoy the feeling of and community of being able to talk to you in a more organic way and in a, on a more sort of natural level. And I think that we were able to really build off of that very early on and realize like, hey, we don't need to be shooting editorial all the time because it's really expensive, as I'm sure a lot of people here know. And it could literally just be folks on the team taking pictures on their phone of something they think is interesting or cool or that she's gonna like. You know, and these are the things that are going to get shared. And these is, this is what's going to get people talking about our brand to their friends and to their friends and to their friends. Um, and in the early days, that's really how um, we spread the word and how we grew. You know, and also, frankly, how we grew a lot of, you know, folks on the team in the early days. Our, like, third or fourth hire who ran our social media um, was a blogger who had, like, found our product and thought it was cool and wrote about it. And we were like, we want to meet you. And then she asked us if we would ever consider hiring somebody to do social media. And we were like, well, yeah, we can't keep doing this, so why don't you come on board? Um, so I think that we were really, really, really fortunate that we, you know, we're building the business kind of in that era and as part of that era. Well, Daniela and Amy, thank you so much for taking the time. Rainbow that was exactly right? correct. That was wonderful. Oh my goodness. We didn't well, even uh, we didn't even ask her to do that. She did not. I, I, I was like, hey, what's gonna go with this teal dress? I was like, these are gorgeous. Actually, it took me a little while because as you guys go onto the Baba Bar site, which I know many of you probably have, there's a lot of selection. So um, thank you again for sharing your story and all of your tips and insights. We're so excited. What a great way to kick off International Women's Day. Um, thank you all for joining tonight, and we will see you at the next Exo Group Founders event.